A very clear way that we see evolution occurring in our medical field is the antibiotic resistance of various bacteria. Let's take a short dive into this antibiotic resistance, look at bacterial evolution specifically, and kind of uh, reinforce Darwin's uh, four postulates here. So I want you to be able to define transduction, transformation, conjugation, plasmid, efflux pup, pump, and if you can't already, <coughs> antibiotic. It, it's something that kills the bacteria, keeps the kids. Um, relate antibiotic resistance to variation, heritability, and differential survival and reproduction. I'll be able to define and explain the exciting thing known as stress-induced mutagenesis, and as an option, be able to connect this class to microbio, which is Bio 351. So I talked to Dr. Kobe to make sure I wouldn't be stealing his thunder, but there is a bit of overlap here. So if you want to just steal the PowerPoint and the notes and use them again later, go for it. So let's talk about bacterial evolution. So we see bacteria evolve very quickly. Not as quickly as HIV, but still disturbing. Uh, penicillin was introduced in 1943, and resistance to it was first documented in 1965. Ceftaroline was introduced in 2010. Resistance was seen as early as 2013. So we kind of wonder, are like bacteria different to some different rules here? Because they evolve so quickly compared to uh, other organisms. Well, let's take a look at what bacteria do to evolve. And reinforce, of course, that uh, evolution has variability, that individuals, in this case different bacteria, must be uh, different in the population. They must have some sort of different resistance to antibiotics, which implies that the resistance to antibiotics was already an allele in the gene pool before the introduction of antibiotics. As an allele in the gene pool, it is heritable because it is in the DNA, and phenotypes must be genetically passed on to offspring. And last, of course, that there is differential survival and reproduction. In every generation, individuals with one phenotype are going to be re reproducing more than individuals with other phenotypes. In this case, those that are more antibiotic resistant are going to reproduce more than those who are less antibiotic resistant. So one way that this is true is we, uh, one reason they evolve so fast is that they have short generation times. And these short generation times mean that for a human, you have uh, 20 years per generation. For bacteria, it can be 20 minutes. So if you eat coli bacteria in your gut, hey down there, has a 1 in 10 million chance of getting a mutation in a certain gene, and there are 2, what is that, uh, 1,000, million, billion, trillion, 2 trillion E. coli in the intestine made per day, then 2,000 will have a mutation in that gene every day. Now, how many uh, nucleotides long is that gene? Well, if it's 2,000 nucleotides long, there's a chance that every one of those muta uh, every mutation could be tried for that gene. But how many of these are going to be advantageous? How many are going to be neutral and accumulate? How many days do E. coli have available to them before we actually see evolution? Well, if we had 2,000 new mutants per day, every day for 75 years, which is a human lifespan, a reasonable one, that's a, that's a real lot of mutants, he says, not doing the math at all. But I think what happens is a short generation time means they can evolve a lot faster than we can, um, or any animal that we can see would evolve. Let's see how they uh, increase their, their ability. First off, we have, of course, a recombination. Now, we have recombination as well, but bacteria, even though they only have one genome, they only have that uh, one circular chromosome, and there isn't really meiosis, they still do recombine their DNA. So they do have methods by which they actually swap out certain genes for others. And I said certain genes, yes. They swap out portions of their genome, and if it's successful, then they're going to get new, um, new alleles and, new, and perhaps even new genes, including some genes that may infer resi confer resistance. So recombination is already one between a bacterial genome and the various plasmids. Uh, there's also transformation. So if there's some loose DNA in the, in the environment, um, bacteria will do much like the English language will and just kind of pick it up. So there's a good word uh, in another language. We like it. We're English. We'll pick it up. That's, uh, that's uber excellence, you know? And uh, that's, that's not how you use that word. It says every German, every German gene in my body. <laughs> oh, well, LOL. Um, it's the uptake of foreign DNA from the surroundings, just like the English language takes up random words and becomes stronger. So every bacteria, or many bacteria, are going to be taking up random DNA to um, better adapt their their environment. This is actually how we make bacteria that express genes for things we want. We put a gene for uh, producing insulin 
uh, in the environment and the bacteria will take it up and now you have an insulin making bacteria. Nice. Uh, which we use to extract insulin and then we can actually have our, uh, our insulin for diabetics. Uh, transduction. So transduction is a different method. Um, this is where you're actually going to have a bacteriophage take up some DNA from one bacterium and then it's going to introduce it into another bacterium. So phages are going to have DNA in them and phages are going to get DNA from the bacterium. As the bacteria is replicating this DNA, sometimes they get, uh, they get an allele from a bacteria. And, that's, uh, and it will transfer that over to another bacteria. It turns out phages are really good at introducing new DNA. It's kind of an accident for the phage, but it doesn't reduce the phage's fitness. So, meh, who cares? And then there's conjugation, kind of bacterial sex. This is when you have a uh, tube form between two bacteria, bacteria, and they're going to swap DNA. And this is frequently done with the plasmids. It's not a good idea to swap your whole chromosome because uh, you can't guarantee the guy on the other end of that conjugation tube is going to be uh, giving back a whole chromosome. Oh no! Oh no! I gave away my chromosome. No, it doesn't happen that way. They often give up, give away a certain um, plasmid. Often the plasmid would be F factor, which allows a cell to donate this plasmid for conjugation and it causes an F positive cell to make a new plasmid, a new copy that goes over and makes another F positive cell, which will then be capable of bringing F positive plasmid towards other bacteria. So conjugation is a swapping over. So <coughs> one plasmid in particular is the uh, R plasmid and that's a resistance plasmid. It has some sort of resistance gene. And this can be a lot of different things, of destroying penicillin, pumping penicillin back out, preventing it from entering or altering target. We'll cover this in a bit more depth. Oh yes, that's the fun today. And um, this is a resistance plasmid, and that can be transferred between bacteria through any of these. It could be recombined into the genome and then become heritable. It could be transformed because the plasmid just, and there's a plasmid just out in the environment after bacteria dies and the new bacteria takes it up. It could be transducted. Um, but a virus were to take this plasmid over or it could be uh, conjugated over. Whatever way it is, this is a way that DNA can be swapped between bacteria. So moving on to uh, why, that they, why they evolve so fast. Again, transformation, transduction, conjugation, fast generation times, and increasing variability. I'm realizing I probably shouldn't have erased that first, but I'm not good doing all of that. <laughs> All right, let's talk about antibiotics and resistance to them. So antibiotics are anything that are going to be targeting the bacteria and getting rid of them, biotics, getting rid of them, but not hopefully harming the organism as a whole. Now, penicillin is one of these great antibiotics introduced very early on and still very much in use today. If you get strep throat, you're probably going to get penicillin because strep throat has never, it, streptococcus of that type has never evolved resistance to penicillin and you not going to have resistant bacteria. As I said, you only get the alleles that are already in the gene pool. So um, unless a new mutation arises, there isn't going to be streptococcus that's um, strep throat type streptococcus that's resistant to penicillin. And if it does exist, well, let's hope it'll pass it on. But you get that and it will also take out the lactobacillus in your uh, intestinal tract, which it leads to um, some side effects, but it doesn't kill you, just kills your bacteria. And then your, um, what's it called? Uh, Appendix can be used to recolonize some bacteria because your appendix is less likely to be full of penicillin. That's one hypothesis at least. So we've established bacteria's colonies or infections are naturally diverse as variation. DNA can be shared and passed down in heritable ways, with multiple ways as heritability. Antibiotics represent a selective pressure because they're killing off the bacteria, thus giving differential survival and reproduction. And only the surviving bacteria are going to be the ones that reproduce. So this is non-random reproduction in regards to the antibiotic resistance alleles. So penicillin, here you go. Beautiful little thing. Made by fungi in nature to compete with bacteria. It's the first widely used antibiotic. It was actually hypothetically being used by the Egyptians that used moldy bread in some of their, um, some of their uh, cures for bacterial infections. Now, it's not gonna be a full-on antibiotic, antibiotic treatment, but it's certainly going to harm the bacteria that are trying to invade. So in addition to garlic or something, it's gonna help. So it's an allelopathic compound in nature. It's targeting uh, what's called DD transpeptidase. DD transpeptidase is gonna be building the cell wall. And if this penicillin targets DD transpeptidase and thus stops the cell wall from build it being built, then that's gonna make it so the bacteria cannot uh, grow and reproduce. And bacteria that can't grow and reproduce 
tend to die. It's really their only option at that point. So that's the mechanism by which penicillin is acting. So how does a bacteria avoid being killed by penicillin? Well, it can alter the target site. So the DD transpeptidase, uh, you can alter target. The DD transpeptidase can have an amino acid sequence change such that it's not going to be affected by, um, by the, the penicillin. It's not going to bind in the right way. Uh, there's also something called an efflux pump. Now, your uh, microbiome is going to go into more depth in this, I believe. Efflux pumps are going to get the penicillin back out. So penicillin diffuses in. This efflux pump senses it. And before the penicillin can interact with DD transpeptidase, it's going to pump the penicillin back out. And hopefully it doesn't come right back in. But if it does, it gets pumped out again. So just get, get them out of there. Uh, then there's beta-lactamase. And it's kind of a big one here. So this uh, beta-lactamase... This already exists. It's just beta-lactamase tends to be uh, really substrate-specific, and there are 300 different types of beta-lactamase around in different um, bacteria. Each has their own potential mutations already existing in the gene pool. Some of these mutations are actually going to... Now, do I go into that one? Yes. Um, reduce substrate specificity in the beta-lactamase's active site. So normally it would be taking apart um, beta-lactams. I can't remember another good example of it, but not penicillin, but other things that are similar to penicillin. And um, when you reduce the specificity of that, um, that active site, penicillin can, can fit in there. You reduce it even further, and you can actually digest other penicillin-like antibiotics. This reduces the enzyme speed. But as we're going to see in a paper later on this uh, semester, there can be other mutations that would increase enzyme speed if the active site were a little looser. And now that this is going to make the active site a little looser, those ones will actually increase the speed and thus be what we call compensatory mutations. Now, you also have beta-lactamase inhibitors, which are going to inhibit beta-lactamase, thus taking down their ability to get rid of penicillin and increase the effects of penicillin. So add a drug to a drug, and now you're going to get more side effects. I mean, more eff eff efficacy. Efficacy. There's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> what about tetracycline? So... I was on a tetracycline regimen once. Oh, yes, fun days, fun days. And, uh, <laughs> give me a bit of a rash on the back. I'd scratch my back and look like I've been whipped. Um, it's just itchy, maybe itchy. It can be a skin irritator, but tetracycline is also effective. It's often used uh, yeah, for small infections. So it inhibits translation in prokaryotes. So what it's going to be doing is it's going to attach to the um, ribosome. And it's going to be taken up in the ribosome in such a way that it's, the ribosome is not going to be effective at making new proteins as it reads through the uh, nucleic acids. What you can see is, I mean, look at the structure of that with all those rings. It kind of almost looks like two, amino a two nucleic acids next to each other. So it looks close enough for a bacterium that it would think this might be um, RNA of some sort. Takes it up, and it's not RNA, and now I can't make proteins. Oh, okay. So how does it work? Well, you can, uh, how do bacteria evolve? Well, they can alter the target. Changes in the uh, ribosomal RNA are going to make changes in the ribosomes. And if the ribosomes look different, they may not be as effective at taking up tetracycline, and thus they will be inhibited. Uh, there are, of course, efflux pumps. And these efflux pumps will do the same thing. They'll get rid of tetracycline and things that are similar to tetracycline. We also have a mechanism here for protecting the protein synthesis, and that's um, other proteins are going to protect the protein synthesis from tetracycline getting in there. So these other proteins are going to stabilize the ribosomal complex in such a way that they're not going to be affected by tetracycline. And then, of course, there's, um, just like beta-lactamase, there are other enzymes here that can digest tetracycline. So it's a very similar kind of uh, mechanism here to penicillin resistance that you see <coughs> in tetracycline resistance. The bacteria have various ways. And here's the deal. A bacteria can have any one of those four ways. It doesn't need to have all four of them. It can just have any one of those four. And if it's effective enough at creating tetracycline resistance, then that bacterium is going to have a higher fitness and thus is going to increase the antibiotic resistance. So what you see is any very, the variable population is bound to have some mutations in it. 
And some of these mutations are going to confer enough of a resistance and they can be passed on to others and you really satisfy all of the variability, heritability, differential survival reproduction, and then the non-random mating where only the survivors that have these specific alleles are going to be um, continuing and making more offspring. So last up, let's get some hopeless stuff. Uh, Multi-drug resistance. Multi-drug resistance is, I mean, why stop at penicillin resistance? There can be a, uh, a, pu a pump that can pump out multiple different antibiotics that look like penicillin. Ampicillin? Yeah, why not pump that out too? Um, things that can pump out tetracycline you might be able to pump out thing, other things that are similar to tetracycline. So reducing the substrate specificity, so long as it's not like pumping out DNA or something, um, reducing the substrate specificity of an efflux pump would mean that it can now have an efflux pump to more things. And last, let's have this one. It's called stress-induced mutagenesis. Oh, yes. Here's all the doom. And this is the idea that a bacterium can have just non-mutated, it can be non-mutating bacteria. And environmental change is going to mean that it has low, it's got low genetic variability to begin with. Um, it's going to go extinct. You have what's called the uh, constitutive mutators. They have a high genetic mut uh, variability, a lot of a lot of lethal mutations, but you know it's a risk we all take. So they have a high genetic variability because they allow themselves to have a higher amount of mutation. And what happens there is uh, natural selection can favor that, at least some of them. So you see these, uh, it's averages A, and then it has to move to B. But it can only move to, it moves to B, and now after the uh, after natural selection, it's all, it averages B. Whereas that non-mutator, um, it averages A, and there is no genetic variability that includes B. Okay. And so the cost of being constitutive mutating is you accumulate more lethal mutations, and thus you may suffer from a lower fitness. Or you have more deleterious mutations. Remember, it's easier to break a clock than it is to make a better clock. So let's say you have a stress-induced mutagenesis, though. This is the best of both worlds. You start with that a genetic variability that includes point A but doesn't include point B. But there's an environmental change, and that induces stress. And under conditions of stress, you mutate your genome. You just, you know, mess around with it. And uh, some of those mutations may be what, it's, uh, what the environment is looking for, in which case you now have the variability to be selected on. And this is what bacteria can do. If the situation gets bad, they can just mutate themselves in an increased amount, and there's a higher chance that they'll get the right mutation. If they don't, well, they would have died anyway. So stress-induced mutagenesis is an induced response to increase the rate of evolution. So why don't you go back to the beginning where we talk about bacterial evolution, what gives it an advantage, and add onto that stress-induced mutagenesis. All right, so what's the future of antibiotic resistance? You know what? I want you to post up in the forum, what's the future about antibiotic research? I mean, resistance, okay, more antibiotic resistant strains will evolve. <laughs> we know that. That's a given. What about future? Are we still going to continue just, well, we need more antibiotics. So, so what? We'll have more antibiotic resistance? I mean, what's your thought? I want to hear um, your opinion on the matter. No, human extinction is not a good option. Don't write that down. So yeah, post up on the forum. Thank you for coming. I, I made this exam on Monday, filmed it on Wednesday, had it on Friday. So, um, yeah, have a little fun here. Anyway, um, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned some more about bacteria, and uh, I'll see you later.